Admiral James Stavridis in Massachusetts, welcome to Hard Talk. Are the attacks in Paris a game changer for the international community? I think they are, and we have to acknowledge it's really not just Paris, Zainab. It, of course, began with the downing of the Russian aircraft, which cost more lives than thus far have been lost in Paris, almost immediately followed by the horrific bombing in Beirut, and now the Paris attacks. Put those together, a thousand dead, over 500 seriously injured, on a population-adjusted basis, as I say to American friends, this is a 9-11 level event. I think it will change the game. President Hollande says there will be a war without mercy. British Prime Minister David Cameron, it has become even more clear that our safety and security depends on degrading and ultimately destroying ISIS. We will be safer right across Europe if we destroy this death cult once and for all. But frankly, Admiral, we've been here before, haven't we? We've heard these kind of statements since the September the 11th attacks, and yet the attacks keep on coming. Indeed they do, although I would point out that it's all a matter of case by case. And I think when you look at the Islamic State, it's not just the events in the last three weeks. It is the horrific pattern of selling women and children into slavery, of torture, of beheading. I mean, it really is at a different level, Zainab, than what we've seen from any terrorist organization. Secondly, they are making a huge amount of money doing it, so they're extremely well financed. And thirdly, they're experts at branding, marketing, the internet, proselytizing, recruiting. This is a different level of threat and it, it simply demands a response. What is the level of threat in your view? Because you could argue that these actions we've seen, particularly in Paris, whereby innocent, unarmed civilians are targeted in this way, is it to some extent perhaps an act of desperation? Uh, I do not think so at all. I think it is a building crescendo of activity which will get larger and larger. And frankly, as we look at the potential over time for the use of weapons of mass destruction, we ought to be very concerned. We see uh, loose uranium for sale in Eastern European markets. Picture that in the hands of the Islamic State. It's often said, why did Al-Qaeda kill 3,000 people on 9-11? The answer is, because they didn't have the means to kill more. I think the Islamic State is anything but in a desperation mode. Because President Obama has said that they have made progress in reducing the amount of territory that the so-called Islamic State hold in both Syria and Iraq. And indeed, in the past couple of days, we've seen Kurdish forces retake Sinjar in northern Iraq, although, of course, uh, Raqqa... Palmyra in Syria and Mosul in Iraq are still in the hands of Islamic State. But, but there, there is that point that President Obama makes. Um, is he wrong? He is making a point, uh, and he often uses the words contained. In other words, uh, it hasn't gotten worse. The Islamic State hasn't made it to Baghdad. They haven't made it to Damascus. They haven't made it to uh, Beirut. Uh, on the other hand, what has grown is their capability to reach across international borders and boundaries. So the president is correct in saying they have been contained territorially, but I think their capability, Zainab, unfortunately, is growing. OK, and you uh, want to see NATO play a much more active role. You want it to take over the US and coalition bombing operations. You even want to see perhaps up to 15,000 NATO troops on the ground. But uh, does NATO have the political will to do all that? I mean, one influential voice in this debate, Professor Michael Clark from the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, here in London, thinks that there isn't. Um, I do, and I, I would point to historical precedent. If we go back to the 1990s, NATO found the political will to go into the Balkans, a situation not that terribly different than what we see in Syria today. Huge numbers killed. Serbanitsa, 8,000 people killed in a, in a, a few week period. Uh, millions pushed across borders, an area of Europe that was breaking apart, not unlike Syria. NATO put 60,000 troops there. Afghanistan, after 9-11, NATO was there with 140,000 troops eventually. I think the political will will come as a result of the horrific behavior of the Islamic State.
But we didn't see any invocation, in particular, of Article 5, which says one, an attack on one NATO member is an attack on all after the London transport bombings in 2005 or the Madrid train bombings in 2004. It's actually only been applied once in NATO's history, and that was after the September the 11th attacks. So it, it's not necessarily true, is it, that it's going to be that simple to get NATO to take over these operations? Zainab, I agree. I think that in the coming week or two, we'll start probably not with an immediate conversation about Article 5, but with an Article 4 consultation, which is when a particular member nation comes to the North Atlantic Council and asks for a consultation, a conversation about events. That would be the key to driving toward an Article 5 declaration. I'd say it's a slightly better than even chance at this point that events will push us toward an Article 5. Certainly the way that President Hollande and Prime Minister of Great Britain are speaking, as well as the American President, would give me the sense that we'll probably end up Article 5, but perhaps not. If we don't, this will become another coalition of the willing activity as opposed to an official NATO operation. All right, well, let's just ask you, let's fast forward and, and just imagine that perhaps uh, we have had Article 5 and what kind of NATO operation are you actually advocating i mean intense more inten intensified airstrikes we've seen that in the last year they haven't really had that much impact on the ground what kind of combat troops are you talking about to go into syria and iraq as well so just spell out what you think would work i think we would need to add a significant component of special operations troops immediately to go on the ground and this could come from all of the NATO nations working through the NATO Special Operations Headquarters, which is located in Belgium and has a global capabilities. Secondly, we'd amp up the intelligence collection and intelligence sharing. Third, we would increase our presence in the cyber world, using all of the NATO members who have that capability. Fourth, as you mentioned, Zainab, we would increase the bombing campaign. Believe me, adding all of NATO's capabilities to what is already in place would be a significant increase. Fifthly, we would move to train the Kurdish forces, and there are 150,000 Peshmerga uh, operating in the north. We would re-energize the training program with the Iraqi security forces, recognizing the frustrations and the failures there. But ultimately, when you put Peshmerga from the north, Iraqi security forces from the south, you have a significant capability to balance with the combat bombing campaign. And then seventh, I'd say Turkey's army, the second largest in NATO, uh, would have to step up in this scenario. So total of troops, I would say about 15,000 NATO troops, excluding Turkey, which I would hope would have a larger land contribution to make. Uh, I think when you put all that together, you have the, the means to take on the Islamic State in a significant way. And you, you mentioned special operation forces from NATO, but look at the fuss that we've had in the United States already. At the mere 50 that the US has already sent in, one example, Senator Angus King said of the deployment of special forces not authorized by Congress. Criticisms, you know, that uh, America could be dragged into sim Syria simply because of the deployment of 50 special operation forces. And now here you are advocating that NATO's biggest army, the U.S., should be thinking of sending many more. You can find different voices on all sides of this debate, Zainab. And just recently we heard Senator John McCain, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, one of the most powerful voices on the, uh, in the Senate, talking about the need for a much larger force than I'm advocating. You'll find others who evince enormous Middle East fatigue after the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think you'll see all those voices, but the trend, given the horrific events of the last three weeks, is clearly toward a more activist role in the region. Well, but President Obama, of course, a, a very influential voice, if not the most influential voice in the United States, has said, look, if 50,000, 50,000 troops were sent into Syria, what would happen if there was an attack in Yemen or Libya? I think, as I mentioned earlier, Zainab, each of these are a case-by-case -case set of decisions for our leaders. 
I think that the Islamic State has managed to vault themselves to the very top of the greasy pole of enemies that we face. So each of the other cases you mentioned would have to be examined. By the way, it's not just NATO. We need Russia involved in this. We need the states, the Sunni Arabs. And I'm confident over time you'll see a confluence of all of those powers uh, working this challenge, just as happened in the Balkans. So bring in Russia and just put to one side the fact that Russia has been engaged in bombing operations in Syria on behalf of their ally, President Bashar al-Assad, leading to the indiscriminate killing of civilians. I'm not saying they're targeting civilians, but their uh, operations have inevitably meant that civilians have been killed. That's one point. And then a second point made by Ivo Dalda, a former American ambassador to NATO, who says that some would worry that too much cooperation with Russia would be at the expense of Ukraine. Are we to forget all that business over Crimea? No, the world is a complicated place, but uh, the essence of leadership is prioritizing challenges. And again, I think the Islamic State is at the top of the challenge list at the moment. I, for one, would say let's get the Russians involved in the military hard power campaign against the Islamic State. The Assad situation, I think, must and ultimately will be solved in a political, diplomatic way. That effort is underway, as you know, in talks in Vienna. Um, I think over time we'll see a political, diplomatic solution on that side. On the side of attacking the Islamic State, I think we can and will and should all operate together against them. But that's the point. Will everybody operate together against them in this coalition of the willing NATO and then key Middle Eastern allies, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Turkey? For example, the Turkish government, Saudi Arabia, implacably opposed to Bashar al-Assad. Are they really going to come in in this kind of coalition whereby you put the fight against Bashar al-Assad on the back burner because you deem that Islamic State is the bigger enemy? Uh, two months ago, Zainab, I would have said probably not. Today, I would say they probably will, simply because of the, the changing perceptions of the scale and capability of the Islamic State. But I agree with you. It's going to be a close call for the Turks. It's going to be a close call for the Saudis. Uh, but I think our position, the United States, Great Britain, NATO, ought to be to try and prioritize, go after the Islamic State first, pursue the diplomatic political solution to the Assad regime and the civil war broadly. We're going to have to try and pick our way through some very tricky choices, but that's how I would score it from where we sit right now. Tricky choice. Um, Nicolas Enna, a French journalist, said on Hard Talk before the Paris attacks, and he'd been held hostage for 10 months by Islamic State. And he said, look, Islamic State have killed hundreds of people and Bashar al-Assad's forces, a quarter of a million dead in Syria, one way or another. The numbers are far greater. So the point I'm putting to you is, are you getting exercised about Islamic State because the hundreds that they have been killing have included Europeans, whereas the quarter of a million killed by Bashar al-Assad are by and large Syrians? No, I think both are horrific challenges, and I think the Assad regime is utterly illegal. And I hope that Bashar al-Assad ends his days, like Milosevic from Serbia, in a jail cell in The Hague. Uh, but the real threat for the moment is the potential on the side of the Islamic State. And of course, it's not just uh, their killing of uh, Christians and NATO members and Europeans. It's also blowing up Russians as well as uh, the uh, Hezbollah in Beirut. It's unacceptable behavior across the spectrum. And the potential on that side of the equation, I think, is worse. In terms of Assad, again, I think that's going to be a political diplomatic settlement just because, as you raise, Zainab, of the implacable support, thus far anyway, that Russia has afforded to them. The reality is we're going to have to settle that diplomatically. But if indirectly, by focusing on um, Islamic State at the expense of Assad, I put to a point by Francois Eisberg, a leading French security expert, who has warned that the more you support Bashar al-Assad, 
the more you are getting on the wrong side of the Sunnis and giving them one option only to support ISIL. So actually, your strategy could backfire because it, you could actually get more recruits for Islamic State. Indeed, that would be a possibility. However, I would argue that uh, the way in which we're pursuing the diplomatic political solution on the Assad side of the equation, which is creating a big tent, bringing the Saudis, the Russians, the Americans, NATO players, including the Iranians, into that conversation, at this point is the best bet of settling it. But let's face the facts, Zainab, that the overlay of all of this is a Sunni-Shia conflict that runs throughout that crescent of the Middle East that's frankly very reminiscent of the wars of the Reformation in Europe, which killed a fourth of the population. So there's an enormous strategic challenge that has to be resolved within the region. The flashpoint at the moment is Syria. We have a very dangerous entity in the Islamic State. We should destroy it. Then we can solve the larger construct of civil war in Syria. Although, of course, uh, Islamic State are, are Sunnis, and, and as you pointed out, they're killing lots of Sunnis, including the Kurds, who, who, who are Sunnis themselves. But just looking at the impact of military intervention, it can be counterproductive for a different reason and actually encourage acts of terror. For example, the former London Mayor, Ken Livingston, who was Mayor of London in 2005 during the transport bombings, has an expressed a view, that, as held by others, that some European Muslims are actually encouraged to carry out attacks in Europe when they see uh, what they see as Western interventions in Muslim lands. They often cite that as a reason as to why they're carrying out these attacks. So that's another very difficult side effect of the kind of strategy you're advocating. Indeed it is. And here I'd point you to uh, a, a marvelous book that really unpackages that idea. It's called The Accidental Gorilla by David Kilcain. And it, it further makes the point that even when we conduct the attacks in these Islamic states, for every uh, terrorist that we kill, we create three or four more, the accidental guerrillas who decide then to become terrorists. It is a terrible and difficult part of the equation. And that's why hard power is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need to use the hard power to go after a group like the Islamic State. The long game is in the soft power side, or what some have called smart power, finding the balance between hard and soft. That's education, jobs, integration, assimilation, cultural understanding. All of those are important in the long game. But at the moment, we're in a short game, and that is why we need to apply hard power to the Islamic State. So the implication of what you say, then, is that part of the reason why we are seeing attacks in Europe and possibly even in France is as a result of a sense of alienation and uh, a sense of economic deprivation or exclusion on the part of some of these uh, young men who turn to these ghastly acts of terror. There's no question that is a part of it. Another part of it is the interpretation of parts of the Islamic faith by some radicalized elements. Uh, another part of it is economic deprivation. Another part of it is the recent wars in the Middle East. All of those things, I think, are contributory. All those things need to be addressed, and they are being addressed in many different fora. Uh, but since we're here today to talk about the Islamic State, uh, unfortunately, we are going to need an application of lethal hard power against them. There is no compromise. There is no sense that we can create a soft power solution to the Islamic State. But the long game uh, of soft power, bringing all of the remedies to the issues we just discussed, Zainab, that together, I think, will solve this problem as best we can. Are you not putting perhaps too much emphasis, Admiral Stavridis, on what hard power can achieve when we look at some of the operatives of Islamic State, um, these young men who are European nationals and go and fight in Syria and then come back? That's not a question of hard power. That's about good human intelligence, about good um, border control, um, cyber, you know, making sure that you've got good regulation of what's being uh, said on the internet and, and that kind of thing and that's not you know putting your tanks on the lawn is it 
No, and I would argue, again, the long game here involves all of the things you just discussed. Intelligence, surveillance, cyber, um, our ability to integrate, all of those things critically important. But occasionally there comes a time when you need to fire a bullet. And I think we're at that time in regard to the Islamic State. We do need to do the other things, but we need to pick up the focus on the Islamic State as well. And if you do achieve what you say that you want to do is to, you know, destroy, degrade um, Islamic State, are you, are you not, you know, it's possible that something else will emerge, re-emerge, and, you know, we've had Al-Qaeda, then we've got Islamic State. There'll just be something else that comes up in time. I think that's a possibility, and that's why, as we were just discussing, the long game of all the other things we've talked about is important. But let's look at the Libyan operation, which appeared and felt very successful militarily. We applied hard power. We saved the population from Gaddafi. But then the state has since fallen into chaos and has uh, followed up with both al-Qaeda and the Islamic State there as well. The lesson is we can't simply go in, apply hard power, and then abruptly leave. We need to play the long game. That's uh, being involved economically, uh, diplomatically, politically. And that is very challenging in this part of the world. But I think that we start with the hard power and then we follow the long game with the soft power. It's our best set of opportunities. Admiral James Stavridis, you've been a military man all your life and uh, you've served in, in you know, most of the world's trouble hotspots, Afghanistan, you name it. And you, but you yourself have said you cannot deliver security through the barrel of a gun and you've been talking now about how you need hard power as well as soft power, what you call smart power, a mix of the two. Now you're retired, you teach at Tufts University as we can see in Massachusetts, but when you reflect on your career and what military power can actually achieve, you know, here we are talking about Syria, there's got to be a political solution in the end, you know, talk to Bashar al-Assad, negotiate whatever that turns out to be in the end. Do you now think to yourself, hmm, I might have uh, done better if I'd been a politician or a diplomat rather than a military man? <laughs> no, I have never felt I would be better as a politician. But what I like to think of myself is as a military man who understands the importance of diplomacy and development alongside defense. And if we look at places like the Balkans, like Colombia in South America, and we see that we've been able to meld those three things together, uh, defense, development, economic aid, and uh, diplomacy, that's where we will be the most effective. Unfortunately, at this moment in time with the Islamic State, we need that hard power instrument. But the bigger game, the long game, really is to bring those three things together. Um, and that, to the degree I've had impact in my life and career, I hope that is what people will remember. Admiral James Stavridis, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.